again on page 863 of your text. Seizure is an episode of excessive or abnormal electrical activity of all or part of the brain. This abnormal electrical activity is manifested by disturbances in skeletal motor activity, sensation behavior, and consciousness. Seizures can also be from secondary origins of a febrile state, head injury, infection, metabolic or endocrine disorders, or exposure to some type of toxin. Also consider if there is history of alcohol, acute alcohol withdrawal, electrolyte imbalances, stroke, or heart disease. Epilepsy is defined as two or more seizures experienced by a person, a chronic disorder with reoccurrence, unprovoked seizure activity. It may be caused by an abnormality in electrical neural activity or, or an imbalance of neurotransmitters. Now let's discuss the different types of seizures. Seizures are either classified as partial or generalized. Partial seizures begin in one area of the cortex and generalized involve both left and right hemispheres and also a deeper in brain structure. Generally, we will talk about generalized seizures within six different types or subgroups. The first one being generalized tonic-clonic. When we think of a seizure, this is usually the one that comes to mind is what we may observe in our patient. A tonic-clonic seizure lasts two to five minutes, begins with a tonic phase, which is stiffening or rigidity of arms, legs, muscles, and immediate loss of consciousness. This is then followed by the clonic phase. It's a rhythmic jerking of extremities. The patient or client may bite their tongue or have incontinence of bowel or bladder. Also will typically experience acute confusion, be lethargic and fatigue up to one hour after the seizure. The second type of um, generalized seizure is tonic. So this lasting 30 seconds to several minutes and this is stiffening or rigidity of the arms, legs, muscles, and immediate loss of consciousness. And then clonic is the third type of generalized seizures. It's lasting several minutes, usually with rhythmic jerking of extremities, contraction, and then relaxation of muscle groups. Next, we'll talk about an absent seizure. This usually lasts for seconds. There is a loss of consciousness with a blank stare or eye, eye fluttering that you may observe with your patient. Autotisms is involuntary behaviors that you may note such things such as lip smacking, panting, picking at clothes. Um, this is also seen with complex um, partial seizures. Seen mostly in children um, and tends to run in family groups. The myoclonic seizure, it lasts for several seconds. There is typically brief jerking or stiffing, stiffening unilateral or bilateral presentation with a monoclonic seizure. Next, we'll talk about the sixth and last type of the generalized seizure group, and that's a tonic. So this is an akinetic seizure, meaning sudden loss of muscle tone for several seconds, followed by confusion. Um, you can imagine this can be really harmful to patients and increase their risk of fall and lead to injury. Now, partial seizures, these are known as focal or local seizures. You may hear them referred to that versus a partial seizure. Um, remember, this is only originating in one hemisphere. Most often seen in adults um, can be tonic-clonic or tonic-clonic individually, um, typically divided into two main classes with a sim simple partial seizure, meaning your patient remains conscious. So this is how you can differentiate your generalized seizure group from your simple partial seizure group usually reports an aura. So remember we talked about auras when we discussed migraines. Um, this meaning they um, have, a, have a certain smell, maybe pain or like a deja vu moment before the seizure takes place. Um, your patient may also have one-sided motions or skin flushing. Now complex um, partial seizure usually lasts one to three minutes. You, your patient may experience loss of consciousness with this May, so, may also experience a set of those unconscious behaviors that we talked about earlier with lip smacking or panting. Um, these typically last for several seconds to minutes and the patient is unaware um, of his or her actions. Um, afterwards, the patient exper often experiences amnesia. 
and most commonly older adults. Um, 40% of all seizures diagnosis typically occurs in the adult population. You can imagine this can be very difficult to diagnose because symptoms are similar to other um, neurobehaviors such as dementia or psychosis. In new onset seizures in your older adult population, there's a lot of correlation with other conditions like diabetes, stroke, Alzheimer's, hypertension, and acute brain injury. There's also a class of seizures that falls into the unclassified category or idiopathic category, and this actually counts for half of all seizure activity, so therefore it cannot be classified into those groups we just discussed. Now, etiology or genetic risk, um, it can be idiopathic. Um, primarily, epilepsy is not associated with any specific cause, um, but can be influenced by genetic factors. Again, let's talk about secondary seizures. I mentioned those in the previous slide. Um, this is not considered epilepsy. Um, this is re resulting from a secondary issue, so like brain tumor, acute alcohol withdrawal, high fever, head injury, electrolyte imbalances like hyperkalemia or hypoglycemia, either stroke, head injury, heart disease. So again, a secondary reason it could be contributing. It's also important for you to ask your patient who um, has new onset or history of seizures to help identify any triggers, or they may know their triggers and tell you things such as emotional stress, increased physical activity, fatigue, alcohol, or caffeine consumption. As discussed on the previous slide, you will need to be familiar with how to differentiate um, primary and secondary etiology and genetic risk, with genetics being associated with primary seizures, secondary being related to a specific disease process or disorder, such as an underlying brain lesion, tumor, or trauma. We'll talk about TBI and brain tumors in upcoming chapters metabolic disorders like diabetes, acute alcohol withdrawal, electrolyte imbalances, high fever, stroke, head injury, substance abuse, and heart disease. Assessment or recognizing cues of seizures begins on 863 in your text. It's important that you ask um, a family member or one who may have witnessed a seizure to describe the seizure. How long did it last? What did the patient or client look like? How many have they had? Did they report an aura? If the patient um, is on any antileptic or seizure medications, or in general, what all medications is the patient taking? Any history of head trauma, alcohol, and drug use, um, and past medical history, such as concern for compliance um, with medications as well. Now, diagnosis is typically based on this history and physical um, examination with your patient and family member, kind of their description of signs and symptoms, their presentation of aura, if there's an injury or this secondary um, disorder that we can associate with increasing the risk, use of alcohol or substance abuse or other um, medications, over-the-counter meds or supplements, if they have history of hypertension or CBA. Now, diagnostic studies, this is mainly done to rule out other causes. So kind of, again, as we discussed in 1940, um, a diagnosis of rule out, um, typically with an EEG may be performed, a CT, MRI, or a PET scan. And then labs are completed to assess for other metabolic um, or electrolyte disorders. Here we are going to discuss non-surgical management of your patient um, with seizures. Drug therapy um, tends to be the cornerstone of management of patients with seizures. Typically, about 80% of all seizures can be managed with antileptic drugs or anticonvulsants. Many can be used in mood disorders because of their effect on the brain. Typically, a patient is started on one medicine at a time, and that dosage may be increased or another drug attempted until control is attained. Combination of medications may be needed, but typically initiated, um, again, one at a time. Dosage is adjusted until therapeutic ser serum levels are attained without causing some major side effects, and we'll break down um, the drug categories here. So you do need to know um, 
that action alert box on 864. So looking at this box, we'll talk about Dilantin or Phenotoin. It can be given PO or IV, usually infusion, um, used for most seizure types. You do want to discuss with your patient and their caregiver or family member about um, side effects of um, anemia can also cause cardiovascular collapse, meaning hypotension, especially if administered too fast. So monitoring their CBC is important, and then also a serum drug level. So therapeutic range is usually 10 to 20 micrograms per milliliter with a toxic level being greater than 30. You want to make sure your patient is not currently taking Coumadin. They also know if this is a medication that's added in the future due to management of other comorbidities, that Coumadin can increase um, the half-life. So drug's half-life is the time it takes for half of that dose given to be eliminated from the body or bloodstream. So this is gonna increase their risk of um, toxicity, dilatant toxicity. You want your patient to be familiar with the symptoms to look out for with dilatant toxicity, which would include dizziness, slurred speech, fatigue. Um, when management or giving this medication through IV, you wanna make sure um, you flush with normal saline before and after administration. And this infusion is typically given 50 milligrams per minute. And you do not want to mix this um, with any other IV fluids except normal saline, okay? And that is also listed in your drug alert box on 865. Now, um, the next antileptic or anticonvulsive that we will discuss is phosphenatoin. This is given IM or IV, and it's actually dose equivalent to dilantin. It can be given at a faster rate, and there's less side effects. So therefore, it can be one that typically reach for for your patient. It can be used with other IV fluids, including dextrose. Next, we'll talk about Tegretol. Um, its route is given PO, usually sustained release. Therefore, we cannot crush it. Your um, type of seizure that it seems to be most beneficial for are partial and generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Discussing side effects with your patient would include headache, dizziness, blurred vision, leukopenia, um, and then monitor CBC and serum blood levels as well, as we previously discussed. Um, now, Valium or Ativan, so Diazepam or Lorazepam, these are IV routes. With Ativan, it's typically four milligrams over two minutes. You may repeat to a total of eight milligrams. This is um, seizure management um, that is crucial, especially in um, prolonged seizures, and we'll talk about that upcoming here in this chapter. You want to monitor for respiratory arrest. Make sure you have airway equipment available and you're collaborating with your respiratory therapist to let them know um, what your patient is receiving. Monitoring your ABCs. Um, there is a, a Valium rectal gel. This would be important for your um, family member that um, may be administering this medicine when that loved one and, or patient is experiencing acute seizure in the outpatient or home setting, that they know how to safely give this rectal gel um, when an oral tablet is not safe for that patient. Now, Keppra or Levotrazotam, this is also given PO. It's used for partial seizures. It's very important that we monitor renal function and then also assess for gait or coordination problems. Next, we're gonna talk about Depakote or valproic acid. Um, this is usually therapeutic in all types of seizures. Um, side effects to monitor for include tremors, liver function, studies as we can see increased liver enzymes with this medication, bruising, monitoring that CBC, PT, PTT, and AST as we know that um, platelet synthesis is occurring in the liver. Therefore, if we're having elevated liver enzymes from liver injury, we may see um, increased risk of bleeding and bruising. Do be familiar with the healthy teaching for patients on page 866. Um, this is healthy teaching for the patient with epilepsy. So knowing um, no drug information to discuss with your patient, very important that when taking this medication as prescribed and not missing a dose.
um, and what to do if they miss a dose or it cannot be taken. Understanding the importance of a blood draw for therapeutic or toxic level assessment. Do not take any additional drug over the counter drugs without conferring with your um, prescriber. Wearing a medical alert bracelet or necklace. Um, carrying some type of identification, letting them know you have this history of epilepsy, um, because again, you may not be able to communicate that to your EMS. Now, follow up with your neurologist and PCP as directed. Cannot stress enough that a family member, a significant other, or a caregiver knows how to help you in the event of a seizure um, and knows when your primary care provider or EMS services should be called. Want to investigate and follow state laws concerning driving and operating machinery. I want to say that Georgia is six months to a year um, without seizure um, to um, reinstate driving privileges. Not certain about that, but again, being familiar with what your state laws are. Avoiding alcohol and excessive fatigue, as we know these may be triggers um, for seizure occurrence. And then also putting um, your patient and those family members in contact with Epilepsy Foundation, um, giving them kind of an organized support group for additional information. Before beginning to talk about the management of status epilepticus, I want to review with you again the seizure precautions that was on the previous slide and also in your text on 864. It's important that oxygen, suction equipment, and airway are readily available and that your patient has IV access that can be saline locked if they do not have fluid orders. Um, side rails up at all times, but I would check your hospital policy on that. That can be considered a restraint. And then padded side rails use is controversial, so again, that would also be based on your agency's policy. Um, some facilities do allow placement of a mattress or some type of pad on the floor instead of using side rails. Always want to make sure your bed is in the lowest locked position. Never, ever, ever insert padded tongue blades into the patient's mouth during seizure. This can chip teeth, increase the risk for aspiration from fragment, um, and can obstruct the airway. Precautions to um, keep your patient safe is on 865. Um, we discussed these in 1940. You still need to be familiar with these, including protecting your patient from injury, um, not forcing anything into the patient's mouth, turning the patient on the side. The purpose of this is to prevent aspiration and keep the airway clear, removing any objects that might injure your patient, um, and then surfing of oral creations if possible, but again, not during seizure, um, loosening any restrictive clothing the patient may be wearing, um, do not restrain or try to stop the patient's movement. Recording time of begin and end of seizure, um, assessment of vitals, neuro checks, um, keeping the patient on that side, allowing the patient to rest and recover. This is all after resolution of the seizure. Um, there's additional guidelines here for documentation of the seizure. And then most importantly, I cannot stress enough your observations during the seizure. Um, noting any change in um, pupil size, level of consciousness, um, presence of apnea or cyanosis, incontinence of bowel or bladder, movement and progression of motor activity, lip smacking, tongue or lip biting, how long it lasts, um, when it took place, was there any expression of the patient of an aura, and um, what does the patient um, do after, what is their activity like after the seizure, and how long does it take them to return to their pre um, seizure state. It is not unusual for your patient to become cyanotic during a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. This cyanosis, however, is generally self-limiting and no treatment is needed. Okay. Some primary care providers may pre um, prefer to give um, your high-risk patient or the liberated patient oxygen by nasal cannula or face mask um, during the postictal state. But for any type of seizure, always observe and document these assessment findings that are reviewed there in that table. Viewing here management of status epilepticus on 865. This is a medical emergency. It's life-threatening um, seizure activity that's lasting more than five minutes or 
repeated occurrences of seizures over the course of 30 minutes is characterized by cycles of tonic-clonic activity with short periods of calm between. Our concern here is the cumulative effect um, of the seizure activity is going to in interfere um, with the patient's respirations or oxygenization ability to maintain their airway. The client's in great danger of developing hypoxia, hypothermia, hypoglycemia, and exhaustion if the seizure activity is not stopped. Care is centered around the ABCs with that airway being priority, notifying your provider. Um, the patient may need to be intubated by anesthesia or respiratory therapy and maintaining that IV access. We're going to need this IV access because the drug of choice um, to aid um, in hoping to stop the seizure activity is out of or Valium with IV push. The patient may also receive that loading dose um, of IV dilantin, but not to um, exceed those ranges we already talked about with 50 milligrams per minute um, utilizing an infusion pump. And then if you're piggybacking it using only normal saline with the primary um, IV infusion and then flushing with normal saline before and after administration. Again, the discussion of meningitis, I want to briefly review the surgical interventions or management procedures that begin on page 866. These interventions are again utilized when non-surgical management with antiolytics has not been successful or there's been adverse reactions to those medications. So a vagal nerve stimulus, this is um, attempt to control continuous, simple, or complex partial seizures. This is not used for generalized seizures due to concern for neural defects. You will have a stimulating device similar to like a pacemaker. So think of this as a pacemaker of the brain versus the heart. It's surgically implanted in the left wall of your chest with an electrode leading to your left vagus nerve. This is tunneled under the skin, so nothing that you're gonna see externally. And then connected back to that generator in the left chest usually takes two hours under general anesthesia for placement and that may be activated by the surgeon in the OR or postoperatively. Um, it's programmed to patient tolerance. The patient will activate um, this generator in the left chest with a handheld magnet when they experience an aura, therefore aborting the seizure. Um, they may experience a change in their voice quality because the vagal nerve is being stimulated. So you want to monitor for hoarseness, cough, shortness of breath, neck pain, dysphagia. Advising the patient to avoid MRIs and microwaves if that device is not compatible. There's also a conventional surgery procedure, again done when everything else fails and used most commonly for complex partial seizure primarily. Um, explaining to the patient family they will be in an intensive care unit. They're going to have a um, continuous EKG monitoring. They'll be taken off all anticonvulsives and um, when the seizure area has been identified, with um, electrodes being placed on, on that brain tissue to monitor for activity, that area may be surgically removed if possible. The concern here is that may be originating in an area that is um, vital um, to life, so it may not be possible. So pre-op um, consideration for your patient is similar to your craniotomy, which we'll discuss in upcoming chapters. Now moving on to meningitis. First, we're gonna talk about um, meninges and those on um, their location. I encourage you to refer to the handout where it has the different layers. This should likely be a review for from A and P. You have three connective tissue coverings that encircle the brain and spinal cord. The spinal meninges surround the spinal cord and are continuous with your cranial meninges. Um, most superficial is the um, dura mater. So the spinal cord is also protected. It has a cushion of fat and connective tissue in the epidural space. Then you have this middle layer, layer which is called the arachnoid space because of its web-like appearance. And between the, dur the dura mater and the arachnoid mater is the subdural space, which contains interstitial fluid. And the pia mater is the innermost meninges that's gonna adhere to the surface of the brain and spinal cord. So what is meningitis? So we know itis means inflammation. So this is inflammation of those men meninges we just discussed that surround the brain um, and spinal cord. There are many different types that we will discuss. Viral meningitis is, um, is self-limiting. So typically full recovery by your client or patient. Causes include um, 
measles, mumps, herpes simplex, herpes zoster, when your patient receives a lumbar puncture and there's analysis of their cerebral spinal fluid or CSF, there is no formation of exudate, usually it's clear, or with evidence of increased protein and normal glucose levels. The signs and symptoms experienced by your patient will most commonly be fever, photophobia, headache, malaise, and nausea. Um, may have genital lesions if this is consistent with herpes simplex, um, origin of the viral meningitis, this is type 2 herpes simplex, or they may report recent um, treatment with a cyclovir, currently receiving that treatment, symp symptomatic treatment here with viral, again, it's self-limiting. You may see it termed in progress notes or HMPs as aseptic meningitis, because again, we don't have any organismal um, growth on CSF cultures. Now, fungal um, signs and symptoms are similar to what we just discussed with viral. Your patient may or may not have a fever. And treatment is um, with IV antifungal agents. This is most commonly seen in advancing AIDS for those immunocompromised clients, like those who are receiving immunosuppressants or chemotherapy drugs. And then bacterial meningitis. This is a medical emergency with a high mortality rate of 25%. Metacoccal meningitis, um, this typically only occurs in outbreaks. So those um, that are higher risk are like college dormitories, military barracks, or living in crowded areas. This is why many states require vaccination um, to live in college dorms. You want to encourage that your patient receives their influenza, pneumonia, and meningococcal vaccines. Sometimes this um, predisposing bacterial infection can also be from otitis media or an ear infection pneumonia, acute or, acute or chronic sinusitis, um, commonly seen in the fall and winter months with upper respiratory infection or strep pneumonia, which is another most common type with this bacteria colonizing in the nasopharynx. Before we begin talking about um, recognizing cues and interventions for meningitis, want to review with you more about some possible complications here and how these complications occur due to access of the organism, like in bacterial meningitis to the CNS. So this infecting organism is going to produce inflammation of the arachnoid and pyomotor um, meninges of the brain and cerebral spinal fluid. The organism in this pus or exudate that's being produced by the infection is going to spread to cranial and spinal nerves. Increased cranial pressure um, is likely they're going to occur as the CSF is blocked and there's decreased um, flow. There's also changes in cerebral blood flow because we know that um, blood flow likes to move from area of higher pressure to lower pressure. So if pressure is increasing, that's going to make it more difficult for perfusion, increased risk of stagnus and clot formation. So how does this organism gain access? It can gain access via the bloodstream. Routes include penetrating trauma, surgical procedures, um, skull fractures, um, can lead to meningitis due to direct communication of cerebral spinal fluid with the um, environment. And then the organism organism's gonna enter the um, central nervous system and travel to the subarachnoid space. Let's begin to talk about some signs and symptoms. Um, this is key features box and 867 of your text. Restlessness, agitation, irritability, abdominal back pain, nausea, vomiting, severe headaches, um, may report um, nuchal rigidity, which is stiff neck. We'll talk about positive Brzezinski sign and Koenig sign. We, um, in the past, have correlated these with being having stronger evidence to support meningitis. New evidence kind of shows um, these do not correlate as well as we thought, but you still need to be familiar with them. You need to know um, how they're performed, what a positive would mean, and how to differenti differentiate between the type of signs. And we'll review those. I would encourage you to look back at your handout um, that for your A&P review of the meninges with the testing for um, Brzezinski's sign. Your patient's going to be in a supine position. You'll have, typically, the provider is going to place their hands um, behind that patient's neck and then passively lift their head towards their chest. If that patient has um, irritation of the meninges, they're likely going to flex their hips and knees inward in response to that passive neck flexion. And then Kerning's sign is different. The patient's still going to be in the supine position, but their um, 
provider will flex their leg at the hip and knee as shown in your image. And then as they try to extend the leg uh, while keeping that hip flex, the patient may report pain or there may be a spasm um, and that muscle group is gonna resist full extension of that extremity and indicate possible irritation. Next we'll talk about some uh, laboratory assessments of meningitis and keep including cerebral spinal fluid analysis, um, possible blood cultures to evaluate for sepsis, CT scans, um, and then different big considerations based on your patient's risk, such as older adults, they may have compromised and over increased um, cranial pressure, may have a CT prior to their lumbar puncture. CT may demonstrate inflamed meninges, abscessed, or intracranial hypertension. A broad spectrum antibiotic may be given prior to lumbar puncture. The importance of that lumbar puncture is to identify getting a cell count, um, differential protein and culture, because this is going to help them not only tailor the antibiotic therapy if appropriate, but even help identify whether this is viral, fungal, or bacteria. Now, when looking at your best practices, your care of your patient with meningitis, this is in the box on 868. Um, taking vital signs, performing neurological assessment every two to four hours, also your cranial nerve assessment with particular attention to cranial nerve three, four, um, six, seven, and eight, monitoring for changes from baseline, managing pain um, with both um, pharmacological and non-pharmacological methods, vascular assessment, and comparing those for any note of change, um, drugs and IV fluid as prescribed, um, recording eyes and nose carefully to maintain that fluid balance because we know that fluid overload is only increased the risk of intracranial pressure. Monitoring body weight. We know this is the best way to identify fluid retention early in our patients. Monitoring lab values, reporting abnormal findings um, to your um, medical team. Positioning um, carefully to prevent pressure injuries. Performing range of motion every four hours. Decreasing in, um, environmental stimulus, we know this increases intracranial pressure, so a quiet environment. Minimizing exposure to bright lights. Maintaining head bed, head, bed rest with head of bed elevated 30 degrees. Um, very specific precautions based on hospital policy. Um, with bacterial meningitis, referring down to that action alert box in, on your book on the same page. Place the patient with bacterial meningitis um, on droplet precautions in addition to standard precautions. So this is going to be gloves and a mask, no need for contact precautions like a gown here. Um, when possible, placing that patient in a private room, staying at least three feet from the patient unless, of course, that that mask is in place. Making sure the patient um, maintains these precautions and wears a mask if they're transported outside the room for any diagnostic procedures teaching visitors about the need for these precautions and how to follow them. Um, always monitoring for complications, um, increased cranial pressure, vascular um, dysfunction or compromise, fluid electrolyte imbalances, seizure, and shock. Your most important nursing intervention for this patient is going to be monitoring and documenting their neurological status. Um, I cannot stress that enough. The earliest neurological change that may indicate increased cranial pressure, we've talked about this, you need to know it, it's decreased level of consciousness. And then making sure you feel comfortable um, and confident in your neurological and cranial nerve assessment. Now drug therapy, um, antibiotics are again based on that cultural and sensitivity result generally started on the broad spectrum until the cultures are received. Bacteria, um, for bacterial meningitis, there's a two-week two course of antibiotic therapy. Goal to start this um, therapy is within one to two hours of that prescribed time. Commonly used antibiotics are ampicillin, ampicillin penicillin, um, may have increased intracranial pressure, which could increase risk for seizures. So you may want to know um, if antiolytics um, or anticonvulsives are readily available on the unit in your crash cart. Always monitoring your patient's response to these interventions and therapy. Use of steroids. Your patient may be on steroids. Um, this is somewhat controversial in um, meningitis management. Um, it is still recommended for strep pneumonia. This has uh, anti 
inflammatory benefit. And then nutrition, let's not forget about nutrition as we're acutely treating our meningitis patient. Diet should be high protein, high calorie with small frequent feedings. Droplet, droplet precautions, making sure you maintain that as you go in and out of the room. Um, you're stressing the importance of this with transportation of your patient out of the room and then also with your visitors or even those um, medical teams or additional members of the healthcare team that are coming in and out.